And that means we're live. And so, hi there. Uh, hi. My name is Jay Frost, and I'm the host of the Philanthropy Mastermind series brought to you by Donor Search. And you've probably heard me say this before if you've been here before, which is that we're not going to be talking about Donor Search here today. Um, although we love them for providing a platform to have conversations like this one. But if you want to learn more about their services, and I hope you'll check them out, you can do that at donorsearch.net and learn a lot about your donors. And if there was ever a time of year when we wanted to know about them, it's now, especially for the kind of conversation we're going to have in a moment. But you can also see a recording of this conversation and share it with your colleagues who can't be here live uh, over at DonorSearch.net under the Resources tab, where it also will be over on YouTube. So with that, I want to introduce Julie Yurko. Um, it's so great to see you after so long. Yes, yes. We met a long time ago in a, a different world. Time. In a different world. Um, and so let me, uh, for people who don't know you, uh, I'll try to go back a little bit in time, first of all, with a little bit of bio and correct me where I'm wrong. Sure. Um, and uh, so first of all, uh, for those who are unaware, Julie is serving as the president and CEO of the Northern Illinois Food Bank. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. It's really timely to do that. And uh, you, uh, however, when I first met you, I guess it was way back when you were, I think, at the Chicago Symphony, maybe even mm -hmm. before. Yeah. So um, you were there between, oh my gosh, I don't know when the first year was, but you were director of research there and then moved up to become director of major gifts, mm -hmm. moved on into the world of consulting, and then returned and took over a, 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 a senior role in development at the Northern Illinois Food Bank. But that was that was way back. That was in 2009, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, very quickly uh, became, um, you know, moved up that ladder and became the president and CEO of this organization. So lots to unpack in all of that. And I want to give a shout out also for those who know you from this world where we originally met in the world of research, which is so central to knowing our donors. And you served as, among other things, the president of APRA, our association. So, yeah. Also a long time ago. <laughs> it was a few minutes ago. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's great to see your evolution through that lens as well. Um, but before we go any further, I do want to encourage people, if you uh, would let us know that you're here, we'd really appreciate that. You can do that in the chat. Just say hello, maybe where you're from. If you're from a food bank or something like that, that would be great to know too. Um, but also just use that as a place to have a conversation amongst yourselves. Um, we really love that. So just somebody warm up the chat if you would right now and just say hello. I know that our guest would love to see that. Thank you for doing that. Oh, we really appreciate that, Frank. Um, and also we have Q&A here. Q&A is the place for your questions. So please do post them there so we won't lose them among the chat. Now with that, so yes, it's been a thousand years. And um, although it looks like five minutes for you. So what, um, what's the secret to all the energy working with such a tough cause? Oh, um, well, I'm an optimist, for sure. Um, and I find a lot of things in life exciting and engaging. And I just, yeah, that's just my, this is my, my core of my being. Um, for this work, what motivates me in this work is that we are providing a service, right? It's a very basic human need, food. Everybody understands it. We are providing that to folks that are struggling. They're at a really tender and vulnerable place in their life. And we've all been there, myself included. So I had a brief period in my life where I also needed some help feeding my family. And so I, I feel my excitement and my optimism come from the fact that if I, in some way I can help a person um, through this challenging season, um, not only with the food they need, but with feeling seen and heard and cared for, like that is a massive privilege, right? That that's my work is yeah. extraordinary. And so um, so for me, the optimism is providing a little bit of care and love and support and a whole lot of good nutritious food. And how can you not be happy about that? Wow, that's almost a place to, to end, but we're just starting. So um, <laughs> let's hold on to that because we want to revisit it. Uh, thank you for sharing that about your story. That goes to the heart of something else, which when I was talking to you before, you said we should definitely visit. And that's this issue of people not discussing this mm -hmm. or the stigma. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit for those who aren't familiar with it? Is there a stigma associated with this kind of need? And if so, why and how do we address it? 
Sure, sure. So, yeah, I think the the we know there's a stigma, and I can talk about how how we know that and how we've been able to unpack that a bit with those who are seeking help, who we call neighbors, neighbors who are experiencing food insecurity or neighbors seeking help. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that. I think, you know, I, I talk a lot about seasons and challenging seasons in our lives and we all have them, right? Um, it might be a medical diagnosis, right? It might be kind of a change, um, you're moving, right? A change in marital status. All those things can be season. Some of them are socially acceptable or there's not a lot of blame or judgment. Mm -hmm. When someone doesn't have enough in order to feed themselves and their family, I think often people say, well, why, why is that? What have they done wrong? Right? What have they done wrong? Right? Like what decisions have they made? And sometimes you make decisions that put you in a place where you don't have enough. But what we know about folks that are experiencing food insecurity, they're actually experiencing financial insecurity. And that is coming from often employment or education or that medical diagnosis or that just unexpected life hitting you. And so if in some way in the work that we're doing, we can say that's okay, because we've all been there. I say all the time, um, we all need a little help every once in a while. I need it every day, right? And so to say, we're just gonna put that aside, right? We aren't here to, to, to judge or discuss or dive into that. We're here to address this need and make sure that you get what you need. So you can, you can be empowered. Our tagline is neighbors empowered to make the decisions to get you, to, to get you back to where you want to be, whatever that looks like for you, right? I am a mother, I'm a mother of kids with special needs. Their thriving looks different from another person's thriving, right? So wherever you need to be, like that's that's how we want to empower you and that's where you want to go. Now, people don't come to us and according to the USDA, 60% of food insecure households, 60% don't utilize charitable food. They don't come to the charitable food system, 60. How true is that in Northern Illinois? I'm not sure because we're working really hard to, to break that down. Um, but when we go and we ask folks that are experiencing food insecurity, why don't you come to us? The first reason is they don't know about us. Okay. The second reason is they can't get to us. The third reason is I'm too ashamed. So if we can spread the word that we're here and that we're distributing fresh, nutritious groceries for you and your family, and we're doing that in ways, so you can get to us, right? We're doing that in ways that you can receive that food, whether you're coming to a bricks and mortar food pantry or you're ordering online or you're having it delivered to your home free of charge, we are gonna get it to you. And then if we can say, and there's gonna be no questions asked and there's gonna be no judgment, right? That there's, there's gonna be nothing other than saying, yay for you for being courageous and asking for some help and getting yourself to better. Um, that That's what we're all about here. And so if anyone who's online, mm -hmm. um, if you or someone you know needs a little help today, they don't have enough. There is a network of 200 food pantries across the country, 60,000 food pantries across the country and they are there to help you. And I encourage you to go to feedingamerica.org. If you're here in Northern Illinois, go to selfhungertoday.org. There is food finders, get grocery finders, go log in and find the food that you and your family need. The number one reason someone will come to us is someone recommends it. A trusted friend or family says, go do this. And so wow. please help us spread the word. Um, there's a lot in there to unpack. And I'm thinking about the one, two, three part first, which is okay. that implies that there's some kind of survey being done to find out why don't people connect with the resources they need. Mm -hmm. But we also know from surveys that people don't, that only a, a, a certain percentage of people answer any survey. And those who do, sometimes there's a certain amount of shame or stigma attached with even some of those answers. So when you said number three is, that uh, they're ashamed to go, I think is mm -hmm. the way you, you phrased yeah. it, then that takes a certain amount of courage to even say that. So that would almost seem to suggest that the need is greater. You said um, that uh, you know, you're know you working real hard there, which I'm sure is true, um, but 60% uh, of the families you know, who need it aren't even getting the help. It, it must be hard to really calculate how big the need is. Maybe we could start by a picture about what your service area is today. How many people are you serving? Sure. And and you're, you, you couldn't be more right in saying it's very hard to understand truly what the need is. So Northern Illinois Food Bank, um, we serve 
the Chicago suburbs and go all the way out into the rural areas of Northern Illinois. It's 7,000 square miles, it's 13 counties. If you know Illinois, there's Chicago and that's in Cook County and our sister food bank, who I think I might've seen pop up in the chat is online with us. Um, Greater Chicago Food Depository covers Cook County and we do all the counties right outside and to the west of that, just to paint a picture for you. Um, we have, um, there is an annual survey that goes out by the USDA for food insecurity and then Feeding America, of which we're a member of, they come out with annual ma uh, meal gap data for all the food banks across the country. Um, and so for us, it's, um, our meal gap is around 50 million meals. So that's the oh. amount of meals that are at risk of being missed in the coming year. And that is for somewhere around 300,000 people, according to this map, the meal gap, where mm -hmm. the USDA calls and talks to surveys people and says, what do you need to have enough food? And if you are, if you don't have enough, we're going to define you as food insecure, right? Sure. Um, right now, um, we are providing almost 80 million meals. So if our meal gap is 50, we're providing 80 million meals. Mm -hmm. And on average right now, every month, we're serving between 450 and 460,000 people. So when you say like, what's, what's the actual need? It is very hard to measure. It's, it's also hard to measure because, you know, it's an annual survey. And right now we're in this time of very, very high inflation mm -hmm. following on the heels of a recession. Mm -hmm. I'm not a recession, but a pandemic um, that has already placed people that might have been struggling previous to that in an even more precarious situation. And so we are seeing very, very high levels of need here at Northern Illinois Food Bank. And I think the numbers that we're getting from the survey data is low. One of the challenges with, with fundraising in general is translating numbers into lives because um, on the one hand, numbers like that are so mind boggling that mm -hmm. you feel you know, your, your heart and your chest, you wanna help, but then the scale is a problem. And that's something we always deal with in fundraising, but particularly on this kind of scale. So how have you and your team been able to translate that massive problem into something where they can see a face and then mm -hmm. m make a donation that's meaningful? Yeah, well, I, I, I would say it's, um, at least in human services, it's very fundraising 101. You know, it's telling the story. It's humanizing the need. And so getting folks that are utilizing our services, right, the neighbors seeking help, or even our neighbors who are giving help today, right, our donors and our volunteer and our team, and telling their stories and telling the story of what, what brought them to this place and how is it impacting their lives. And so for us, I, I find the most powerful tool is a story and a, a real story. At tomorrow I'm going out we're doing a holiday meal box distribution at a, um, a food pantry that serves veterans, right? Um, that will be the best time I have all, all week, right? Whenever I get out into, and get, have the privilege of serving a neighbor, but also to hear their stories because it also humanizes it for me and helps me learn how we can do better. Um, the second thing though is having good data, right? Mm -hmm. Folks are investing in you. And so, for Northern Illinois Food Bank, we take all that data on how many meals are being missed and how many people are we missing. And we have a whole system that we developed with Feeding America. It's a mapping system to track how well are we meeting those needs and how well are we doing reaching the people. Mm -hmm. And so when we can go out and talk to our donors about you're investing in us and this is how it's impacting lives. And this is how we are system, you know, systematically addressing the issue and making it better and having progress. I think that really motivates folks to want to want to give. You've mentioned Feeding America a couple times, a couple times, of course, and also other food banks. You have sister agencies within the state and then people around the country. Um, I can imagine if we weren't working in that sector that you're in, that people might see that and think, wow, there's a lot of competition there. So even though you're all working together, you're also competing for dollars. Is that ever a sense or, and how do you, how do you navigate that? Because you're obviously all working towards the same thing, which is covering this meal gap. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it is interesting because within our network, every food bank has a service area. 
and we 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 play, we stay, right? Um, mm -hmm. Garnering resources and giving resources within that service area. Right. Well, when you're in a market like Chicago, right? There's not only us in Greater Chicago. Um, there's the Northwest um, Food Bank, Northwest Indiana Food Bank as well, um, out of Gary, and so they are also. We're all in the same market, mm -hmm. um, and so there are times when it's really easy for us to come together. Um, we have a wonderful partnership going on right now with um, our local ABC affiliate um, called Feed the Love. And we all come together and we work, you know, we share information and, and funds come our way together, which is great. Um, other times we do step on each other um, or we do have donors that are giving to both. And I think it's incumbent on us as organizations to help inform donors on how we relate and to whom you're giving and make sure that they're giving to where they want to be giving, right? And know that they're making that impact. Um, my optimism comes in at this point though, right? Because when you're doing good work and when you are doing that transparently, mm -hmm. um, when you're doing that with integrity, um, there's enough, there's enough, right? Like if you do your job well, you know, and if you treat people well, there will be enough. And that's kind of been our kind of mantra. I've, I've been here 13 years and um, that's been my mantra is like, we need to focus on doing our jobs really well and identifying and stewarding our donors, making them feel um, valued, seeing her just like we're doing for our neighbors seeking help, uh, making sure that they know they're making an impact. And when we do that well, we'll have enough. So coming from a place of abundance, to use the cliche mm -hmm. versus scarcity, and that, that's yeah. that's important in all of, for all of us in fundraising in general. But I would think it's particularly important here because you're not. I imagine you're not only looking for dollars, right? You're also looking for different kinds of food contributions, different kinds of partnerships, like you have with ABC. So I can imagine that's complicated, first of all, to do all of that. But if you come from a place of believing that there is a there's a lot of opportunity, then you're you're probably okay. But that opportunity isn't necessarily equally placed, right? Mm -hmm. You just talked about Chicago, and then I know you've got some Chicago suburbs that are quite well to do, and then you have other places where there's you know less economic activity, people have less. Um, how do you navigate some of that? I mean, do you find not just within your own food bank, but as you look at the country and and look at these issues, especially in the state, do you find that uh, uh, you have to work together to make sure that the resources get spread around a little more than than they are currently? You know, um, so from a national perspective, um, we absolutely do that. We call ourselves the network of food banks. So the network, you know, if we have, so we are a food rich, I'm not necessarily a fund rich, but I'm a food rich food bank <laughs> um, because, you know, you know, Amazon distribution centers and, you know, any kind of, you know, Kellogg's GM, we all, we've got all sorts of uh, manufacturing plants and distribution centers. Um, other counties may not have that, right? Like they're just not, that's what we're, that's what we have or the suburbs of Chicago in the middle of, of the city. So we glean as much food, we glean food to excess. Like we, we will get stuff, even if we can't use it, then we will share that out with our network. Um, Feeding America also does um, a lot of, of fundraising, national fundraising, right? So they'll get a grant, um, for example, from a large partner of theirs, maybe it's Walmart or Google or whoever, and they will then have a grant making program to help direct those funds to areas that may not be as fund rich as others. Um, we all have a commitment nationally, and we certainly have one here of where are those underserved communities, right? We know we know there are all sorts of reasons that you have underserved communities, whether they're geographic communities or ethnic communities um, because of systemic injustices, right? Um, and so we focus very heavily on how can we across the country, but also within our own networks, make sure that we are equitably distributing food. Okay, and that's that requires definitely a lot of discussion because not everybody enters that field or any of these fields with the same kind of perception about community injustice, for example, or community needs. So I'll bet that that's always an evolving discussion, isn't it? I mean, it's not just numbers, it's also perception. Oh, I think so, I think so. And this work, the, it's kind of almost like a, the, hu the human nature thing we're trying to overcome mm -hmm. is, um, like I said, we call folks neighbors here, neighbors who have helped to give or neighbors giving help. And um, we're very intentional about that because we're local hunger. Right, we are local hunger. Okay. Folks like to give, 
locally. And when I mean locally, I mean like, oh, I live in this city and I want to give to this city. Or I live in this county and I want to give to this county, which sometimes is awesome. But we have counties, Lake County, DuPage County. These are counties that are wealthy counties. They also have a huge density of individuals. So they also have high need. Every community has high need. But there are times where we need to say for our food bank, gosh, where we need to invest are in some of these communities that don't have the infrastructure, that don't have the local government grants, that don't have the food resources that the others do. Right. And that's incumbent on us. And so, and, and that's what we do. I mean, that's what we do. And that's part of educating the food bank team, our board, our donors, our volunteers. Like, I know you want to volunteer in your city, but where I really need you is out in rural Northern Illinois, where I don't have enough volunteers to right. do this distribution, you know, or I know you want to invest in capacity grants for an agency, right? Buy them a new freezer. But I got, I have this agency that's sitting out in Stevenson County um, where there's 4,000 people and they really need that freezer or cooler. And so we just, we help educate and, and hope that that speaks to people as much as giving, you know, hyper locally. Sure. It, well, that that's the whole matter of uh, donor education, right? Mm -hmm. And it, we they don't necessarily know what uh, uh, those needs are until we talk about them. I mean, how would how would they know? Um, yeah. uh, you know, another thing that strikes me is about the language of this, where we're talking about food banks, and in a sense, I guess the food bank is is a bank, but um, there's another aspect of banking, right, which is similar to maybe a university environment or back at the Chicago Symphony where you have an endowment and that endowment then provides interest and then we can purchase things that we need or fill in the gaps. So if we have a lot of, this is a terrible example, but we have a lot of staples on the shelf and we don't have enough fruit and we need to balance a dietary distribution or something, then maybe we can pull from an endowment's interest to do that. Do you find that uh, since people wanna to give to neighbors, as you say, neighbors to neighbors locally, um, do they, is there an appeal for something like an endowment? Are you able to get people to invest in the future of need as well as its currency? Yeah, you, you you have such strong instincts, Jay, on donors, like you really do, because what I learned coming from a place like the symphony, which is about, you know, sustaining a beautiful, right, highly renowned art form um, to coming to human services, is that in human services, people want to, they want to give for today, mm. like it's like they really want to make sure that they are feeding someone today, because they see it, and they feel it, and for us to say, boy, that person over there doesn't have enough to eat and we're going to have money in the bank is a, it's, it's a hard, hard topic to, wow. to address with some of our donors. Hmm. And yet when I got here um, to the food bank and realized, wow, we really don't have an endowment. Like we really don't. And if we're going to be good stewards of this organization, we need to build an endowment. We need to start a robust plan giving program. You know, we're, Food banks are relative, we're going to be 40 next year. We're relatively young. So I got here when we were in our late twenties. Right. Um, and, and like I said, we had no endowment. And I said, you know, for us to really honor this organization and honor the importance of this mission, we've got to figure out how to start building an endowment. And so we did that um, with some donor, you know, donor directed funds. And now we have this plan giving program. And when those gifts come in, we're able to put them into the endowment. It's still relatively small for us. And that's more unique to us. I know there are food banks out there that have been doing this for longer, have had, you know, stronger fundraising programs, and they've been able to build theirs more quickly. But for us, it's something that um, we really focus on. We call it tomorrow's harvest. And we mm -hmm. find that a certain type of donor who is making those types of plans will say, yeah, let's do that. You know, like, I'm going to give to you during my lifetime. Um, and I'm going to give you that annual support and I'm going to be volunteering and giving you my time, but I'll have you in my estate. And when that happens, then we can help support the food bank, you know, forever and ever. And it, it must be an amazing conversation to have with people who have been giving over time because they're evolving with you and with that story. They're seeing the needs change just as you're seeing them change. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you came in back in, again, I'm trying to remember if this is 2000, when was that again? 2009. And then yes. there's today. So that's, is that uh, 13 years or so? So in that time, uh, I imagine that you've seen a lot change, not just in terms of the development program, did they have an endowment or not, but uh, also the, the needs within the community, the neighbor's needs. Um, the population has changed. 
it's, I mean, uh, the composition of people within each of these places in the area have changed. And the economy has changed dramatically up and down. Mm -hmm. um, we've also just lived through, and we're continuing to live through the pandemic, everything post the murder of George Floyd, all of those things are a dynamic. Mm -hmm. I, what, what is the, what's the biggest change you've seen maybe in that whole time but specifically in the last couple of years, what's changed the most? Hmm. What's changed for the food bank is that back when I joined us in 2009 and we would look at that meal gap yeah, and we would look at how well are we equitably distributing food. Um, we were not meeting the meal gap and we were not equitably distributing food. And so we said, and I mean like we were meeting like 25% of the meal gap, right? And now if you do the math, we're like 160%. And so what has changed is first the recognition that we need to get enough food. Mm -hmm. Second, the recognition is that we need to distribute that equitably. And then third is we need to make sure we have a system that is designed with the people we are serving and allows them right, allows us to address the issue of understanding access and stigma. And so we've had this whole kind of from, we're gonna get enough food and push that food out to we're gonna think about the neighbor and the neighbor who's seeking help is gonna be at the center of every one of our thoughts and decisions around this organization, right? It's gone from a very kind of distribution-like mentality to a human-centered mindset. Um, that's, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, that must change the whole conversation with everybody, including with the, the local and the state government, because if <laughs> if uh, if it's no more just, you know, OK, hungry mouths, X number of units mm -hmm. over Y n amount of time to, you know, Susan or, you know, so whomever needs to be fed. That's a very different way of thinking about addressing a social ill. Um, and I has think that, that was changed? when you talk about George Floyd. Yes. Right. And you talk about a pandemic. I think we all saw, we saw how diverse, beautifully diverse our world and our communities are and our philosophy, right? Our philosophies and the way we approach things. Um, and how for some of us, um, for some of us, it, it is not, it, it, there's not been equity in that, right? Like we have been, for some of us, the marginalization right, the, the lack of opportunity, the prejudice has really impacted certain communities. And so in this humanizing of our work, right, we also have to acknowledge that, learn from that for those of us who may not have the same experiences and may have had more access to blessing and power. Like how do we change our perspectives by making a bigger table and putting more chairs around that table and listening right. to the folks sitting around like how do we do that and i think that's when you when you think about what have i seen change it is definitely changed from uh we are going to serve meals to people to right we are going to come together with communities and build a response that is empowering and nourishing Wow, that's no, it's so interesting also from another perspective, because when you talked about that, you talked about the chairs at the table and listening, which mm -hmm. is so important in fundraising, although we don't always do it very well, but it, it's also kind of a central discussion that's that's more powerfully emerged in the last couple of years about whether or not fundraising and philanthropy generally are listening to communities that we're supposed to be serving. And so when you talked about this listening piece, have you seen changes, maybe not just there, but overall in addressing hunger uh, in the country and in Illinois as we listen better to the communities that are the ones where we're trying to get food uh, mm -hmm. to, to go into theirs and neighborhoods? I mean, are, are we doing it differently because we're listening better or do we still need to work a lot on that? Oh, I think we're always going to have to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, but no, I have definitely seen, I, I've definitely seen some, some changes. Um, there are very tangible changes. One of the things we started here at Northern Illinois Food Bank prior to the pandemic was recognizing the trend in the for-profit grocery world mm -hmm. about whether it's Amazon or any of your um, 
any of your your grocery stores of like we're gonna you can you can go to my store but you can also order online and you can come pick it up from my store or we can deliver it to you or you know you can just deliver it online and have you know from amazon and have it dropped off on your doorstep um we looked at that and said if we're missing folks and we're missing them because they can't get to us whether it's a physical limitation or a time, you know, I'm a single, I'm a single mom of four kids, um, a time issue, like, um, how can we utilize this online technology and create a market, um, mypantryexpress.org, so that folks can get their food in a new and different way. Um, so super tangible, like, how do we change our system? We add online ordering and free delivery. Um, how do we talk to our agencies about adding hours, adding evening hours, removing geographic restrictions? Um, so, so lots of that kind of very tangible, how do we change a charitable food system that's more neighbor centered and, and approaches those neighbors? That's really cool. I think it's the conversation though about who is seeking help and why are they seeking help? And how do we talk about how we wish they didn't need help? Oh, right. And we wish that we could that. end hunger, right? How do we get more people to, to self-sufficiency and stability? Right. How do we partner with the, the government to do that? Yeah. Um, cause that's, that's, gosh, if we could end hunger, that would be awesome. But we also have to change the conversation to, there's no shame in needing hunger. So mm -hmm. let's not say that the world is better if we end it. You can tell him because I geek out about this, yeah. but it's true to me because I think about, you know, if we always say that there, that, that, that the best is that we end hunger, how does it feel like to be someone who might have special needs, who is working part-time? right? And providing for themselves, but it's not enough to make ends meet. And so one of their strategies is coming to us, you know, 24 times a year and getting the food they need, right? Like that's, we need to exist, right? For that person or for that senior um, who, oh gosh, let's say the economy's crazy and the stock market's crazy. And I no longer have the retirement I thought I was going to have and we need it. We, we have to be careful about that language. Um, we have to be careful about how we present hunger and how needing ongoing assistance is okay just like needing emergency assistance a couple times a year is okay sure but as you say it's also being able to think as organizations and as a country or collectives within the country about how to um, essentially inoculate against the need totally. and that's uh that's a very different sort of equation so our are you is is uh is your food bank or other food banks making plans to address that whether that's through something like generating a giant fundraising campaign so there's money there and we can do these <laughs> things early you know yeah. kind of uh, intercept uh the need at the earliest stage or is it um uh, lobbying uh governments in order to provide programs so people don't have the need in the first place how is it that that uh, people who are really the infantry and in addressing hunger in America, how are you able to also um, exert pressure in ways that forestall the need for these services in the first yeah. place? So we definitely, you know, there's definitely advocacy, right? And um, how do we work with our government officials at every level to help them understand hunger and how it impacts people and why people, right, that whole food insecurity is financial insecurity. How do we address it and raise awareness with our, our leaders so that, that they can create policies and allocate dollars to help us address that, for sure. Um, we also, though, some food banks have very specific programs, um, culinary um, job training programs, right? Whether it's oh. culinary training or warehouse training. Um, many of our food pantries have all sorts of programs around um, English as a second language or computer training skills. So, so we can offer those directly. We can also partner with organizations that offer those. And how do we, because folks will come to us, right? How do we, when they come to like our, we have our own food pantry called Winnebago Community Market and we offer also, we call them wraparound services, right? Like mm -hmm. how do we offer these trainings, these health interventions to help folks address all the other um, challenges in their lives that are leading to financial and food insecurity because it's never alone, right? It usually has to do with health, education, job, and housing. Right. Uh, so as you're as you're doing all that, I'm imagining just what it's like to continually build that infrastructure and grow. And that's that's another thing that usually gets short shrift in social service, human service organizations that you don't often have a giant army 
of fundraisers like you'd have at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So is, is that something that you can also find funding for to build your capacity to raise more money, uh, exert more influence? I mean, is that yeah. something people are willing to fund? You know, um, it's interesting. That's something that, um, well, my board is very willing to fund. <laughs> so, you know, is it a directed, is it a restricted grant? That's, I wish uh, all boards were like that. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, the board sees the importance of having a strong, vibrant, large enough fundraising team, which is terrific. Yeah. And we've been able to grow it over the time um, that I've been here. Um, so, so that, that you know, we don't typically go out to a donor and necessarily ask for that specifically. Um, cause still our donors tend to like to fund, you know, the direct service stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but we, we definitely invest and that's one of the silver linings of a pandemic. I think more that just like the recession, when I first joined us, um, the awareness of the need for hunger assistance, just, I mean, it was all over the news, right? All over the news mm -hmm. and, um, donors saw gosh, this is, this is a place that I can help and I can help immediately. And funds came in at an unprecedented level for food banks across the country and for Feeding America. And how we've been able to utilize those funds, we are still utilizing some of those funds, right? To invest in our team, but more, most importantly, to invest in our programs has been really extraordinary and it has enabled us here at Northern Illinois Food Bank to um, have more resources than we've ever had before. And it's, we, we've got a team, we added to the team so that we could retain those donors and steward the donors that came to us during that time and make sure that they hopefully will continue to engage and invest with us um, so we can continue to do, do, to do more. So it's, it's been, like I said, it's kind of one of those silver linings where you wish it didn't have to happen, but um, it, it was definitely helpful for us to be able to invest in the team so that we can retain all these really amazing people that, that joined our community during that time. This is this is a little wonky, but I know you can get wonky, um, which is would do you have thoughts on what's most helpful to an organization, especially in, in human and social services, especially food banks for stewarding donors, for keeping them, for retaining donors? Because that's that kind of uh, retention issue is a problem throughout philanthropy in the United States. Um, people are bleeding donors like crazy, the leaky bucket everybody talks about. But if you've been successful in maintaining the interest and the love of donors as attentions have shifted. Um, what are the chief mechanisms you've used to you know, maintain those relationships and build on them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it's communication, right? It's communication and really good stewardship. And it's definitely differentiated based on the level at which you're engaging with us. Um, I think it's important for us to share transparently, honestly, truthfully, kind of what's happening, why it's happening and how we're responding to it and how with, with their support, right? Like nothing happens here if we don't have folks that are willing to invest their time and their, um, their dollars with us, Not, nothing, right? 60% of our budget is contributed revenue. A third of my workforce is volunteers, like nothing happens. And so to be really honest and open about you all make this place run, and when you invest in us, we can show you the impact. We can tell you the stories and we can show you the impact and we can show you how efficiently and effectively we're going to use your dollars. I mean, it's really about, about the communication with your donors. And that could be an electronic newsletter or it could be, you know, the note you write with a paper newsletter going out to someone. Or it could be for those folks that are, you know, higher donors, they get the phone call and they get the visit and they... Okay. Here at the food bank, we'll invite you to come. We'll be like, we're going to have a special volunteer shift. You know, I'm like, the only way we thank people is we're like, come volunteer with us and we'll put you to work. <laughs> um, but like, it's, it's, it's all about the relationship and making folks feel like they are highly, highly valued and impactful. Um, just on a personal note, my sister, my wonderful sister, elder sister makes meatloafs mm -hmm. at the place where she works with uh, the folks out at Interfaith Community Services out in Escondido, California, and um, goes in there and among the many things she does is to go in to the kitchen program, which does much of what you're describing and make meatloafs, I think once a week, a whole bunch of meatloafs. She's probably made a thousand meatloafs in her life. But that idea about engaging people where they are, you know, uh -huh. keeping in communication and then giving them uh, jobs to do. It, yeah. it sounds like that 
also helps to retain donors. And that's totally. right. Yeah. So digital alone is not going to do it. It's got to be a combination of different things that work for whomever we're talking to, meeting them where they are. You know, um, I recently listened to a podcast and they were talking about the different generations and how right now in America, we have five different generations. Sure. Right. That are within the workplace. Um, in my generation, that personal touch is really important. For me, it's really important. You know, I think we're learning about Gen Z now and how, what, what's going to be really, how are they going to want, is, is digital good? I mean, their whole lives have been on the glowing rectangle. So mm -hmm. what, what, I, what I know today, and most of our donors still skew a little bit more my age than <laughs> Gen Z, um, is that, that the personal touch, having done this work for 30 years, personal touch. Right. It it's, that pers it's, it's, it's that personal touch that really makes people feel valued. So um, the, what's, the, what's the, big, the big push right now as you're hitting the year end and you're willing to spend a few minutes here, what is the biggest need that you have there and maybe other food banks that you're talking to and the network around the country have? Yeah. So um, for my food bank, and I know many other food banks have the same challenge, it's about having enough food. So when I mentioned that we have 450,000 people coming to us every month, um, we plan a budget for about 320. And so, um, so right now with supply chain issues over the last two and a half years, there's been a decline in government food coming to us um, over the last year. And especially since the height of the pandemic when we were getting, you know, my gosh, four or five times the amount of food that we're getting now from the federal government. Um, when you see, um, manufacturers, right? Like that, that whole, the number of SKUs that manufacturers are creating these days are smaller than what they used to, right? They're, okay. they're working so hard because of supply chain issues to keep the core products on the shelves still that we tend to get the food that is new or, you know, something that they're testing or something that has a slight quality control issue. That's not coming to us as much. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Yeah, it's really. Uh, like, I, no I, I used to joke, um, you know, we'd get like caramel flavored bugles. <laughs> um, okay, if there's a way to torture people who are really hungry, it's give them caramel. Sorry, bugles. But... I know, but like, like we'd get some of that funny stuff, right? Like, as they were <laughs> testing products, we're not getting that anymore. And so, for us at Northern Illinois Food Bank, our food supply is down over twenty percent from a year and a half ago. We're down twenty percent. For us, that's twenty million pounds of food. 20 million pounds of food were down. At right. the same time, the need is up 45% from last year. Okay. You know, um, a year ago, we were serving just over 300,000 neighbors every month, and now we're doing 450. Um, and so, so for us, it's food. Um, what are we doing about it? We're buying a lot of food. Mm -hmm. When I talked about, you know, folks were so lovely and generous to us during the pandemic, and we were able to invest a lot of that time Anything we still have, we're investing in food. Our purchase food budget is three times what it was pre-pandemic. Wow. Are you able to share what that is? It's $21 million we're spending on buying food right now, purchasing food. Wow. Pre-pandemic, it was seven. So for us, it's food. And how can we get enough food, but also the right foods? Mm -hmm. So we talk about diverse foods that are not only nutritious, but also culturally diverse. Mm -hmm. foods. And that's that whole human centered design. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say, and, and when you look across, you know, the whole network of food banks, food is an issue. Um, the hardest thing for us right now is if the need doesn't change and with inflation and, you know, I know the Fed's trying. <laughs> no one wants them to be more successful than me right now um, to control inflation, to get that need back down. Um, is, is really critical because for us as food banks, this is not sustainable um, right. for us to buy. We, we were built 55 years ago on if there's food that's going to waste, that's perfectly good to eat, right? This is delicious, awesome food. How do we get that to folks that are in need? Um, Pre-pandemic, we we're 80% donated food, 80 Mm -hmm. um, now we're 60% and we need to get back to the, where we're, we're the most food we're moving is donated. And by donated food, you mean donated from anybody, from the manufacturers with the caramel filled bugles to the local neighbor who has 30 mm -hmm. cans of pumpkin. Yeah, to the grocery whatever, store, you know. To the grocery store. 
Yeah. Um, and that includes probably things like FarmLink, another thing like bringing farm to the, to the, yes. To the, yes. Yeah. We have amazing farmers um, that will grow acres for us and donate that product to us. Now we're in Illinois. Right. Um, so it's, you know, limited growing season and whatnot, but no, we definitely have beautiful, beautiful partnerships um, in agriculture that help get us fresh produce. So that's what you need right now. I'm sure that you and all your colleagues around the country are also thinking about the future. And it's hard to predict the future, but I'm sure you're trying mm -hmm. to figure out what the need is next year, how much you're going to have to spend in order to meet that need um, mm -hmm. now that the need is growing. And the, uh, of course, inflation is just one of the variables that we can't fully predict. Mm -hmm. But what are you predicting the best you can about what the need might be in 23? Yeah, that is the million dollar question. Um, and so, like I said, we pay, I pay a lot of attention to what's happening right now with our economy, we're always looking at poverty rates and unemployment rates mm -hmm. um, to see, because we know that those are going to be some of the greatest influencers on need. Um, quite honestly, whether you're talking to Feeding America or the Urban Institute, um, USDA, you're, you're not going to find it out there. I've been looking for it. My board's been asking. I've been looking for it. You know, we really don't have a great predictor for what we think it's going to look like. Um, but what I know, you know, like, gut wise is if you know inflation is supposed to slow if we can get inflation back under control right that will help put more money in people's pockets um abc news reported maybe a week or two ago that um americans on average are spending more than 400 dollars additional dollars each month for their basic needs mm -hmm. That's not saying I'm going to cut my Netflix subscription, right? Like that's real money. Um, gas prices going down is helping, but until we get the, co the cost of other goods down, it's going to be a really tough time for us. Yeah. I would guess we're in this for about another 18 months. Um and speaking of getting things under control, I've let myself be out of control and I haven't woven in people who have been asking questions. So I'll see if we can mine a couple of these before okay. we before we close out the hour. So one was a, um, an anonymous attendee saying, in my experience, donors tend to find advocacy off-putting and equate it with politics. How do you educate donors in a way that minimizes that association? Oh, gosh. You know, we talk a lot about private-public partnerships here. And so um, to help donors understand, um, and, and we try really hard to be purple, right? Like hunger, everyone understands hunger. And, and I, I don't wanna get involved in, you know, the politics of it all. But, you know, for us to explain, there are wildly successful, pro SNAP, food stamps is a wildly successful program to address hunger. And it gives ultimate choice to neighbors. Um, for us to be able to explain the power of some of these programs and how these programs were created just for times like these. And that when the government, when the government stepped in during the pandemic, we have hard evidence that shows, you know, hunger could have gone through the roof, but with the food they gave and the benefits they gave, we were able to hold hunger at bay and get enough food out and get enough benefits out to our neighbors. So we just, again, it's all about the impact, like showing the impact. And if, and you do have your donors that's going to try and pull you into the politics and say, you know, I'm not here. I respectfully say to you, I'm not here to debate politics. I'm here to tell you the impact of incredible programs that help our neighbors. I, I'd have to ask a follow-up on that because I love that response. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's not about you, you're, you're about the neighbors. So uh, when you say that, there are some people who keep pushing on it, but do most people then respect that answer and then move on and let you discuss with them uh, the, the need of the neighbors? Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. And if we're not their people, if that's their biggest sure. thing they want to talk about, we're not, you know, like that's, we're not your people. Right. right. <laughs> we, had, we had another question from Frank who had, who had asked if you're using anything along the lines of AI tools and, and, and Frank references donor search AI, but you, you needn't talk about that if you don't want to. But if there are tools you use on the side of data or especially artificial intelligence tools, that enable you to, you know, boost uh, giving or better mm -hmm. focus on people's interests or that what, what I, I know you have this deep background in research before all the stuff you've been doing today. So mm -hmm. how is that playing into your work today? today? Yeah, yeah. You know, I would say I'm actually, sadly, Jay, um, I'm probably better schooled in how we're using data um, online tools in order to get the neighbor who is seeking help than the neighbor who's 
giving help. I, you should have Maven Sipes, who heads up our philanthropy team, talk about what we're doing. Um, but we, because I know we have some cool stuff that we're doing over there. Um, but for us, there's a lot using, we have some Google grants and there's something called Google Snap. Um, we're in a partnership with the Theater Family Foundation here in Chicago for a new tool to help neighbors find their local food pantry. You know, we're, it's really about in this world where so many people have access to technology, how can we use it to spread the word and make sure that when they have that courage to ask for help, that if they put in, right, something around hunger, they're going to get hit up with, you're going to get a couple, a couple things are going to pop up, you know, on your Facebook feed about My Pantry Express and your Google Grants is going to pop right up for you. And then you can live chat with our team. All of that's going to happen so that we can make sure that we catch that person and get them the help that they need. Very smart. I love that. Um, and then we had another question from another anonymous attendee. This always worries me when I get an anonymous question, but that's that's OK. That's OK. okay. Um, and that is, are you seeing or perceiving more social service organizations bringing to the table, including to the board table, different voices, the voices of input of those served. And we talked about that a bit before. How best uh, can it be for an organization to prepare for that change and prepare for and welcome more equity? In essence, how to infuse DEI into fundraising? And I might add to that, if I may, uh, specifically under the board. So I, I don't know what your board composition looks like. You, you don't have to talk about it if you don't wish to. But this issue in general is everywhere, thankfully. Mm -hmm. How are you addressing it? Yep. So, um, so gosh, there's so many ways, yes. so many things to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, understanding leadership at your organization, I'm talking about your board and any other, you know, we have an executive women's council and an associate board, um, our volunteers, especially our, we call them volunteer supervisors, you know, understanding who's at the table, having them define for you who they are, right? Surveying them and saying, who are you? Tell me more about yourself, you know, gender, sexual orientation, geography, um, uh, faith, you know, we look at that, um, ability versus discipline, we look at all of that mm -hmm. um, and saying, help us identify who you are and let's figure out who's not here, right? How does this compare to the community in which we operate and the community to which we serve and which voice isn't here? Um, I think that's really important and you have to be really intentional about that. I also think you have to be intentional about, and we don't want you just there because you check a box. We want you there because this is deep in your soul and your passion, right? Which is something we work really hard on, right? Like we want you to help fill out so that we can have all these voices, but we wanna make sure that you feel valued because this is really important to you, right? Right. Um, thankfully, you know, working for a food bank is very different. And I loved working for the symphony, but folks would join the symphony board because it was a symphony board. <laughs> People would join the food bank board and be like, hey, I can go home at Christmas and tell everybody that I'm on the food bank board. Um, <laughs> I hope they're proud of that. Well, I hope they're proud. But you know what I mean? It's not like a, a <laughs> But I do know status. what you mean. It's yes, it's not a, um, a town and gown kind of, you know, beautiful yeah. dresses yeah. for the yes, for the symphony evening. Yeah, I think to get one of the things we survey that group on and then the group that we're working really intentionally to engage is that person with lived experience, right? Right. And so like, we know a third of our board has lived experience. Okay. That's really important. Right yeah. now. We also though need the voice of the neighbor and we need to have a table for them here at Northern Illinois food bank. We have people with lived experience. We don't have people living experience right now, if that makes sense. So we don't have a neighbor who's seeking help today on our board. Oh yeah. That does make a lot of sense. And so yeah. how do you, how do you do that? That must be an issue for many places. Yeah, and for us, and we might get there at some point, but for us, um, we have a neighbor council mm -hmm. that we go to and we say, hey, we're grappling with this issue. Can you help us? Um, we have a team that does a lot of surveying, right? We're looking for a net promoter score with our neighbors experiencing food insecurity. How well are we doing with our programs? Where are we not doing well? And how can we improve, right? So we get all this data from them and then we go to the neighbor council and say, could you help us do this better? Help us understand from your perspective, what's going well and what's not going well. Um, we haven't put a person living um, currently in food insecurity on our board because I think the board has a very specific purpose. And I think the board can be intimidating, right? Like a, a board is really, like if you have a really good board, they're about governance and fundraising. 
<laughs> you know, I need neighbors experiencing food insecurity to help me with my programs. I need them to help me, like, how do we define awareness and access? And, you know, those, the board, it's, it just has a different purpose. And so I want to make sure we have the right people with the right skill set. And I want to make sure it's a place where that neighbor experiencing food insecurity today feels very comfortable. And I'm not sure that the board is the right place for that. My mind could be changed. That's just where we are right now. No, I'm also imagining it. Anybody who you care about everybody you're working with, wherever they are in your community. And that's exactly why you do what you do. But I can imagine if they're also sitting there in the office with you, the idea of letting them leave the office with enough food to feed their kids is, is impossible. So, but that means they're at the front of the line. So I can imagine some conflicts there, potential in our, in our heart anyway. Yeah. Um, I, you know, when we began the conversation, I asked you essentially where all this started for you. And you, you told a little bit of your own story. And, and I'm curious, wherever that Julie was, whenever that was, and Julie today, wh I'm, I'm wondering if you look back, I mean, what she would think of what you're doing now because you lived through some kind of food insecurity at some point you mentioned, and now you're serving a lot of other families. Yeah. What would she have um, to say to you? Yeah, you know, um, gosh, it's a beautiful question. Um, it was a period of my life and it was during the great recession. I was a stay at home mom and I had an infant and uh, my husband at the time, you know, he lost his job and he has said, you know, my, he's now my ex and he told me I can talk about it. Um, he did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong. It was a great recession and he lost his job. And thankfully, um, we had lived in a place where I knew we had enough money for six months. And um, about three or four months into that, I thought, oh, we're, you know, this, this great recession thing is for real. And so I decided to go back to work. But, but during that time, my kids were on free and reduced lunch and were on the free state health care. Um, it never entered my mind to go to the food pantry in my hometown. I just didn't, it wasn't part of my lexicon. And so um, Julie today looks back, and that was 14 years ago, right? I came here to the food bank. Um, that This was the job I got <laughs> as I was experiencing food insecurity. Um, I look back now and um, I, I, am, I, I am a woman of faith and I think there's purpose in this. Mm -hmm. And for as long as I am blessed to steward this organization, right? Um, Boy, I'm, I'm just, I'm so fortunate because I can help people who are just like me. And I know that fear. And I would tell myself 14 years ago, don't be afraid. Because like in most things, um, the plan in this is so much greater than you could ever see. Thank you so much, Julie, for all of this. Um, yeah. I mean, quite really beautiful and, and just beautiful to see you again, but to hear you talking about something that's so meaningful it must be so extraordinarily fulfilling but but keep you motivated every single day every minute if people want to help you how how can they do that how can they reach out to you and help you sure yeah yeah we would love it we say that all the time we would love it if you want to join the food bank uh family here our website is solvehungertoday.org and you can go there um you can there's um, you know, give help, like you can invest with us, you can volunteer with us, we would love that. Um, there's a get groceries button, if you could help spread the word, we would love that. Um, our phone number is there, our our phone number to volunteer, our, our hotline if you need help, that is man 24 seven is there. So please, um, yeah, join us or join any food bank across the country. They're all magnificent. They're, they're awesome. And we would love to have you be a part of the, the family. Um, so grateful to you uh, for the work you do and for sharing some of it today. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, um, thank you, Jay. I'll have to keep talking with you offline, but um, another time after this season of giving, and we all need to really give to our food banks because somebody out there needs it right now. And then hopefully we won't forget to keep doing it in January and February and mm -hmm. March. And we really need volunteers in January, February, and March. Yes, please. Right. So with that, um, thank you for hanging around with us and uh, listening to this this extraordinary uh, work uh, that Julie does. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. We have one more session in the series, and it's tomorrow 
with two people that actually Julie may know from Campbell and Company, the two co-presidents are going to be doing a session looking forward and forecasting the future. So I hope you'll join us for that. It should be really terrific. That's tomorrow. Um, and if you don't know where to find these sessions, if you just bumped into this on the internet somewhere, go to donorsearch.net, look under the resources tab, you'll find all the content we have there, including recordings of ev everything I think we've done this year. There are actually recordings that go back to 2016. There are over 500 of these. These are the ones the most pertinent. This is the one you want to share with your friends. So please do that and uh, stay healthy out there. We'll look forward to seeing you hopefully tomorrow and then in the new year. Bye-bye.